three positions Ohio State needs to emphasize in their 2025 recruiting class. You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Recruiting is one of those things in the sport that you have to always do. Recruit your own players, recruit players in the portal, and definitely recruit High school players every single day. Welcome in, Buckeye fans, to a Monday edition of Locked on Buckeyes here on Monday, January 15th in the year 2024. I am your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. And I'd like to thank you for making Locked on Buckeyes your first listen or first watch of every single day during today's show. We will welcome into the show Brian Smith. He is Locked On's recruiting analyst. Brian and I discuss three positions Ohio State needs to emphasize in their 2025 recruiting class and answer the question, will Dorian Brew be the next player to commit to the Ohio State Buckeyes? I'm going to jump out of here, bring Brian in, and let Brian tackle these important topics. and. Joining us now here on Locked on Buckeyes is Locked on's recruiting analyst, Brian Smith. And before we get him into the show, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official recruiting sponsor across the Locked on College Network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Brian, we're right in that part of the offseason and recruiting cycle when a lot more guys in the class of 2025 are going to get a lot more attention. I do want to open up this show discussing the guys that they're going to be focusing on, but more so positions that Ohio State needs to target in this recruiting class. To me, it's easy up front. You have to get more guys on the defensive line in the 2025 cycle. That is a very big, important factor. They they need more numbers, and they probably need at least one D tackle and one defensive end that are impact guys. Uh, they just got a certain young man from Philly that's going to probably help that. But at the same time, that's this is the beginning of the cycle. Uh, you need probably eight guys in the front seven recruiting wise. You know, you're going to need some linebackers too, but they might take five D linemen in this class. Could pick it pending on especially what's available in state this year for the Bucks. They could take six. Uh, they need numbers. I mean, they lost Scott and that hurt. Yes. You can't replace guys like that up front. So numbers might be the other way to do it. So this will be a very important cycle for Ryan Day and his defensive staff. It's going to be one of those cycles that can, I won't say make or break you in this season, but over the next few years, you could put really be put in a bad spot where you have to go to the portal maybe more than Ryan Day wants to because you're losing numbers, not just losing numbers in recruiting, quality players, impact players, as you call them. Losing Scott was huge because you thought, hey, he's an impact guy when he gets on campus. Nope, he goes elsewhere. Larry Johnson? He got a win, a big win from the kid from Philly. I would, I didn't really plan on this, Brian, but you brought him up. I think it was Mathis. When you watch this kid play, and he already committed to Ohio State. What do you love? I, I love things about him, but I'm curious what you love when you see him play. When he decides to go, it's it's not good for the other team. Uh, he plays cautiously so he doesn't get beat by the run. But when he takes off to really speed rush, he's got the length and the bend you want. And there were plays where he sensed it was going to be a quick screen or some other short pass. He would take one step, set himself, wait for the quarterback to cock, and he'd jump up. And he's got like a wing forward. He's got those kind of arms that you look for for like an NBA player, and he knocked down a ton of passes. He's a very instinctual football player, too. Does need to add weight like a a lot of kids do, but that's fine. I'd rather them need to go up than down because once you get it on, it's harder to lose it. So I think that this is a kid that can play weak side defensive end. Ohio State needs that. They need an impact guy there. Getting him out of Penn State's backyard because he's from a Philadelphia school, that adds a little extra. Um, I was actually on the Penn State podcast recently, and they they weren't real happy about that. But I'm like, sometimes kids just want to do something different. And uh, James Franklin does a great job of recruiting, but you're not going to get everybody in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's a big pickup. And again, you're taking it from your rival, which also helps. You know, it's very interesting because Penn State actually does a really good job 
uh, this past year had some really good defensive yeah. line men. So for you to lose that guy from your own backyard and to go to your conference rival, who Ryan Day is doing a lot of things this offseason <laughs> that are moves that I don't know if it's desperation. I don't know what it is. But he's making a lot of moves, and that's huge for Ryan Day and Larry Johnson. I emphasize Larry Johnson. Right. He's, he's missed on these guys right. over the past couple of years. You and I have talked about it. People said, hey, Ohio State should go up to Keon sure. Keeley because yeah. Saban retired. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I think you should. But you know these guys better than I do. Keon Keeley, if you can get him, it sounds like you should. Well, if, if a player like that goes to the portal, everybody's going to recruit him. Notre Dame yeah. was was – where he was committed. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on with that. But let's let Alabama hire their coach first because that's where this starts. The kids aren't going to make any decisions until Nick is replaced. That could come in the next 24 to 48 hours, depending on who you believe. Yeah. And I don't buy a whole lot of anything with this stuff. I'm just going to wait for the announcement. But at the same time, there's a 30-day window when a coach changes. So that's ticking. Like, how does that work, you know, for these kids? Do they just go ahead and start taking I mean, I don't know. It's awkward. So a lot of the Alabama kids I've heard have had a meeting with some of the superiors on the roster. Hey, let's wait. But again, you get the NCAA clocks 30 days. It's its own portal when a coach leaves. So if Keeley's one of them, I can't even imagine how many teams would be after him. It'd be, it'd be quite extensive. I think so. I'm right there with you. When it comes to Ohio State, we can all emphasize the D-line emphasis that they need to just focus on in recruiting, but you said front seven, and I agree with you. You got to get some impact guys at linebacker. I'm glad they got Peyton Pearson getting it from Texas in the last cycle, but you got to get not just two or three. You might need four guys because, you know, if you get four, they're going to compete, and a couple are going to hit the portal. That's just the way this thing is working right now. You got to put some more emphasis on the linebacker room, just add more numbers and impact players to come to Columbus. I think that's kind of the norm. It's it's awkward, but if a kid doesn't see playing time, they usually take themselves out of the equation. They do. Now, a kid may want to stick around and get his Ohio State degree. It's an invaluable degree and all that. But if you're not playing, coaches are in, they'll say, "Look, you're not going to play this. You can do what you want, but you're not going to play." You know that's kind of how that works. But three, I think, would be minimum linebacker. But again, like with D line, at least one of them needs to be a guy that can play early. And help doesn't have to start. I'm not saying that linebacker and starting freshmen is usually not good because it's so much of a mental game, but they need somebody that can be impactful at Will or Mike or something, at least be a rotational guy, and then compete for a starting job. They need more numbers there. It's not like their Ohio State defense is bad. It's just you're losing a lot of guys after this year, next year. You need to you need to replace them. So they missed on a couple of key targets. They got some, but they're not quite where they want to be. No, they're not. And I do think it's something that can be fixed. I'm not saying I don't want people to think like Jay is saying, oh, there's an issue there in recruiting or with the players. Right. It can't be fixed. No, I do think that block goes going to recruit itself to a degree. Like it's It can only go so far. You have to right. be able to develop players once they get on campus. And if you're not developing them, you're going to miss out on some guys that you really, really want. I do think Ryan Day, though, knows – I say no. I hope, Brian, he understands the importance of this position because once he figures that out, things are going to be better for the defense overall, better linebacker play. And Ohio State may have been in the playoffs this year. It's a really interesting scenario where you can win or lose a game on one or two plays. Yeah. Now, like look at the Ohio State-Michigan game, the throw that McCarthy made, the touchdown, that, that weird play, whether it was a fumble – you got to get first. You got to give it. The pass was insane. Yeah, because <laughs> coverage couldn't have been any better. Sometimes you're just like, okay, what, what, what do you do? But most of the time, when those kind of situations, the ball gets batted in the air, you get a pick or something like that. Those are the reasons you recruit athletic linebackers and safeties that can cover. It's not just the corners anymore. Everybody's got to be able to cover in the back seven. So let's use that as an example. Ohio State did a good job. Could they take another uptick there and get even more athletic for the passing game? Sure. They absolutely could. And their defense improved dramatically last year. They've got a really good coordinator. Now they just got to fine tune. But that little one to two percent is the difference between representing the Big Ten and the big title game or not, and getting a chance to go to the playoff or not. That's what you're recruiting for. It, it's such a fine line, and that's why football is so fascinating. One player, man, it can be the difference between even making the playoffs and winning the dang thing. That that's that's truly the case. Brian, I want to hit on one other position after the break that I think Ohio State definitely needs to emphasize in recruiting. 
people that know the show, listen to the show, they know where my mind might be going, but we'll dive into where what I am thinking next on Locked Up Buckeyes. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The NFL playoffs are here, and there is time to get in on the action at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Guys, it's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com. Once again, make sure you visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Brian, the games are won and lost in the trenches. That's one of the easy things to say about any level of football. It could be Little League or it could be in the NFL you win games in the trenches. Ohio State defensive line it got a lot better this past year. Yeah. I do think it'll take a step forward and be better in 2024. The offensive line, though, man, it wasn't the best thing that I've seen at Ohio State over the past few years, over the past 10 years. And ultimately, I think in recruiting, I say it all the time, you got to have four, maybe five guys every cycle on the old line. They had four last cycle. I think you got to have four, maybe at least five, at least five in the next cycle. Impact guys, as you call them, or what Ohio State needs on their O line next year. At least one guy, and that's hard. O line is the spot of all spots where offensive line. You know, they come in, they red shirt, they do all those things. Ohio State may, I know this is not their norm, but if there's an elite JUCO kid. Just being a college student, being away from home and all that, that matters. And they're going to be more physically ready from the weight room. Uh, that's a possibility. And I think I know that people are going to bring this up and I'll, I'll just say it. Yes, you would take a portal guy. The problem is it's the number one spot that people are looking for other than quarterback, obviously. And there's just hardly anybody, at least one of the elite coaches that I spoke to, talk, he's like, it's not, it's not looking real good here, brother. Um, you know what I mean? Like the numbers were really bad for the upper echelon guy. There was a couple that were pretty good, but there just isn't. So this next portal window opens in mid-April. Keep an eye on that. It's even more important in recruiting for Ohio State. If they could add one more guy, it would help them this next season. And maybe if it's an underclass one, multiple seasons. But they need an impact recruit in this next class that everybody wanted, in Alabama, a Texas, you know, USC, whatever that can play early, especially if they can get a left tackle. In Ryan Day's scheme, they throw the ball a lot, and that left tackle spot is prioritized by everybody anyway. At Ohio State, I think it's as important as any position other than quarterback to recruit. Brian, that Juco thought is something I have not really thought about and really haven't really heard much conversation about it. I understand why that comes up. And sure. ultimately, you it's the Netflix had the documentary Last Chance You, and you get these guys mm-hmm. that literally know, if I don't do this now <laughs> – I ain't got nothing else left on this football field. Right. And I think that you bring that mentality potentially to Columbus. It's great. Yeah, you may worry about the culture. You may worry about what other guys may think. But if that cat gets on campus and is a dog immediately on day one. There you go. Hey, that's the kind of guy you want away from home, has already put on some weight. So you're not trying to do the weight management as soon as they get on. They're like, hey, we need you to put put on 20 pounds. No, he's already done that for you. And he's already worked on the technique at the college level, not at the high school level, already doing it at a college level. That JUCO route might be the way to go in the future for Ohio State to instantly fill needs at any position, not just offensive line. It's the it's – the- kind of the conundrum there's this stereotype with them they all have bad grades that's not the case no it's not sometimes it's a kid that just developed late and or got into football late some of the best players like moss was a kid that played at miami the return guy and all that he was a track kid when he went to miami he was an unknown and i wasn't a juco situation but he was on campus they didn't know he could play a ball it came out and the rest history sometimes things like that happen to junior college level too kid goes track basketball football coach says why don't you try out Next time you look, he's the starter. Next time you look after that, he's the best player on the field. You have to be broad in your thought process, especially when you're looking for like a left tackle. There are very few of those guys. 
yeah. especially for what Ohio State's trying to run, a true pro-style offense with spread mixed in, that's not easy. You have to be that way. And, again, I still think the portal is the first thing they should do. Don't get me wrong because that's that's a lock. There's going to be somebody. But don't overlook the junior college kids. They need more experience. And I'm, I agree with you. Their O-line did not overwhelm last year. They underwhelmed for what they are expected to be at Ohio State. Not saying they're bad. They weren't good enough. Again, this is – it's fine line. But that 2%, 3% is the difference between winning and losing against Michigan, Penn State, schools like that that you play, and then when you get in the playoff, be underwhelming at O-line against Georgia, against Michigan, somebody like that, it, it's not going to end well. So that's that's the difference. If they don't improve there – it's not going to be good. How, by the way, how many guys do you expect back up front for the Bucks this next year on the front? Four guys, three guys? I, have, I haven't even looked. Talk about uh, D line or O line? O line. I don't think really nobody's leaving. Um, so there's a chance that's good, and there's a chance that's bad. Yeah, the, you lose Matt. You lose your right guard automatically because he can't go anywhere else but the NFL. And then the other guy, left guard Donovan Jackson, he's staying. No one else has really thought about like no one else is good enough to leave right now, like at all. Um, which is rare. Like we're having a conversation about Ohio State's offensive line. Saying, they always have at least one guy that's going to the combine. You know what I mean? I mean, I Matt mean, Jones will probably go, but all the underclassmen, they're not good enough to go to the league, Brian. That's how bad things are right now on the O-line. They can hmm. get better, but this is not this isn't Ryan Day's standard that's not being met. This is Ohio State standard that's not being met. That's how off things are right now. That's a little concerning because in my lifetime, and I've been watching Ohio State football since the 80s, there probably haven't been five years that I went, yeah, their offensive line is just not up to par. Right now, I mean, I noticed that last year they were solid against, you know, big games, Michigan against Notre Dame, et cetera, but they never had consistent drives where they just bludgeoned you and you knew it was coming against a quality opponent, and you just smothered them. I mean, they they, they were the sacrificial lamb in the Penn State games. They knew Penn State couldn't score. They didn't even care. No. Penn State would eventually screw up, and they'd score, and they did. That's yeah. pretty much how that game went. But, they, they, you know, and Penn State had a great deed. I'm not taking away from them. But there was no game where they rose to the challenge, kind of like the, when Urban was there. There were a few times people were questioning the offense, and that next game would always happen. The O-line would show up. They'd run for 180 and three scores or something like that. I'm like, yeah, look, you counted us out. I didn't see that last year. So maybe it's a continuity deal, but maybe they do need somebody that's going to compete. So this spring ball will be big for them too. They need you got to have new blood come in sometimes. And I don't know if any of the freshmen can or maybe a transfer, but that's something to think about as well. Brian, they actually brought in the guy, the center from Alabama that – that messed up, messed up, and it, not just a snap of the final game of their final final play of their season. He had issues snapping from what I've read and heard all season long. I think they're bringing him in to be a center at Ohio State next year. I don't, I don't know, but if that's the kind of guy you're bringing in, who was a all SEC guy, like not some bad player, it's just he struggles snapping the ball consistently. That's where we are right now. I, 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 I know. I was at the Iron Bowl the play before the throw yeah. for the touchdown. I was underneath the other goalpost looking directly at the quarterback. And I'm and I'm seeing the ball bounce. I'm like, I mean, it was way but I'm like, well, how how does he he threw that thing a hundred mile an hour on the ground? It was like a bad putt. Of course, the next play it didn't matter with the touchdown or whatever, but I was just like, holy moly. So he's had the yips for a while, and then he had a, a few cases like that in the game against Michigan. Yeah, They might have won that game against Michigan if it wasn't for him. And I'm not saying he can't block, but I might look at him at guard. <laughs> I'm just saying. Maybe that's what they're going to do. But, yeah, he, he didn't impress me in the Alabama-Auburn game. So. No, not at all. Not at all. Brian, running back or safety? we got one more position I just want to throw at you. Which one do you think should be next up for Ohio State's emphasis in this current cycle? Ooh, I mean, that's that's a good one. I think Ohio State's running back situation, just like any school, can be rectified quicker for a couple of reasons. Number one, Alford's a really good coach. Running back is a spot where it's faster to play because it's more natural ability. It's maybe the easiest spot to play early on the field. Debatable. 
Safety, on the other hand, especially with today's spread and all the screens, the RPOs, it's not friendly to play early. So you need to hit earlier on that. So you got to have guys that take a year to kind of learn the scheme. So I'll go safety. Um, there's always a DB in the Midwest they can get or, you know, get out of Baltimore or Philadelphia or something. I'd imagine they'll be able to conquer that. But I'm not real worried about defense in general, though. I mean, last year, let's let's give them some credit. Defensively, Ohio State was freaking good. Yes, they were. They were real freaking good. Their offense, while it wasn't terrible by any means, it still wasn't up to Ohio State standard. And it put the defense in a few spots, I'm being kind, that weren't very enviable. And they still rose the occasion. The Penn State game, I mean, the offense didn't do diddly, but they just massacred Penn State's offense. They were 0 for 15 before finally getting a first down on third down on the last drive when Ohio State was just in no man's land defensively, didn't care, just bleeding the clock. I don't care who you're playing. If you've got a team down 0 and 15 on third down, you've dominated. Yeah. So we know they've got talent. But if you're not good at safety in today's game, you get beat over the top because they set your defense, put players in the right spots. You have to recruit that spot at a much higher level than it used to be. And I, I would go that direction. I, I And, again, I have faith in Alford to, to coach up the spot. They need, need to hit somebody big in every class of recruiting, but that's a spot I'm not real worried about. Will Ohio State's next commitment come from – one of the best cornerbacks in the 2025 recruiting class. We will answer that next on Locked on Buckeyes. This episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from the crazy realities of real life, but can we talk for just a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin, right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if someone I love got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication they needed. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com. Once again, go to jacemedical.com and use offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Brian, when I look out and see guys that are going to be committing soon, I always want to see, is Ohio State in their funnel grouping or a team that they can, might commit to? Dorian Brew is one of those guys that you see him, you see his film, you see his height, you see that he is a 6'2", 185 pounds, he is a sturdy guy out there. He's also pretty fast as well. He uh, checks a lot of boxes in things that Ohio State wants in a corner, which is why I'm not surprised that Ohio State has a chance to get a commitment from Dorian Brew coming up really soon. That's a kid that I've expected them to get for a long time. Michigan, Notre Dame, Penn State, all the normal schools are going to come after him. But from what I've heard, and I do not know the young man, Ohio State's the team to beat. Those kind of kids generally commit pretty early. If he's not committed to the Buckeyes by April, I'd be surprised. He is a priority recruit for Day and his staff. And from watching his film – I'm 50-50 on whether he'd be better offense or defense. It's a good problem to figure out. Most teams put a guy like that at corner because it's so hard to get him, but he can play either way. That's a spectacular young player, and that would be a heck of a way if they could get him to commit soon to kind of get the ball rolling once again with 2025 recruiting, and the Bucs would love to do it, I'm sure, with an in-state kid too. You know, that is one thing when I look at him. What do you I, – I like things – but you've been doing this for a lot longer than I have. What do you like about him? At his length and his height, he's, he's long at the hip. He can change direction more like a 5'9", five, 5'10", five, kid. I always use the comparison. Uh, growing up in Indiana, you live in Indiana now. You know how important basketball is. Yeah. He's one of those guys that can play point guard. I don't know if he's a hooper, but athletically, I can get to the basket. He's that kind of guy. And they're annoying because there's no defense for that unless you put two people on them and then, of course, in basketball court, somebody's wide open. It's the same principle. On the football field, he can make up for ills even if he doesn't use good technique. He's got long arms. He's well over six foot. 
His change of direction is good. He's got good break on the ball speed, and he's pretty instinctual. I think you could play him at safety too. You you can't go wrong. And anytime you get those kind of guys in your class early, other kids want to play with them. So there's the extra bonus. Great players want to play with other great players. Brew is one of those guys. He's also a kid that's fast. I'm not just saying like football fast. Oh, he's I a think he ran a sub. Yeah, sub 11 second. They get, I got wrote it down actually. Uh, 10, 10, 7, 500. A twenty-two yeah, five going. nine two hundred. Oh, that's, that's that's rolling, brother. I mean, if you're anywhere <laughs> under eleven before your senior year of high school, you're you're rolling. People don't realize, oh, this kid can run a ten hundred now again. Now, anything under eleven is legit. Like you're you're really moving. And again, he's a high school kid playing in multiple sports, so this is not a scenario where you're going to be looking at it from a oh, well, he's concentrating on no, he's concentrating on football. Track is the extra. It's just the track times help translate to the gridiron. So I think you're going to look at it from another perspective there. They'll get him faster. And I have confidence in that too at Ohio state strength and conditioning program. If they get him, they've done a good job for a long time. There's no worries, but if you get kids that can run 10, five or better, and he could end up being that kind of guy that are over six foot playing corner. You're really not going to do much better than that. No. So I, at least that's not in my lifetime. It hasn't been. So uh, keep that in mind. And Ohio state again, in state, you cannot lose those kids. If Day's going to take heat from anybody in this class, this would be the kind of guy. There's going to be a lot of competition for Ohio kids from Michigan, et cetera. Can't lose those corners, man, because there's just not enough of them. Brian, do, do coaches still emphasize going after players that play multiple sports in high school? I don't think they care. Okay. If a kid's good, he's good. Right. I've heard different opinions from coaches. Uh, some guys like to see kids play hoops, for instance. There's nowhere there's nowhere to hide on a basketball court, man, because on a basketball court, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. You can or you cannot move your feet to stay in front of somebody. So I know a lot of kids have been scouted for years. Whether we're going to offer them, we're going to go to his basketball game, see if he can guard somebody. Track kids that can run. Official times are still official times. But if a kid concentrates on a sport like football and he's really good, it's also self-explanatory. You, Anybody that's a novice, if you go to huddle and put on Dorian Bruce film, maybe five or six plays, maybe you're like, okay, he can play at Ohio State. That's stretching it. Like he's running away from guys, and it, it's, it's pretty mundane. And his break, when he changes direction, is definitive. These are things you can't be taught. He just, It's God-given. So, yeah, like. He's a difference maker, and it, again, he's an in-state kid. This is the guy that historically Ohio State has made a living on. Why would he be any different? Last thought here for you. You talk about how great kids, impact players, want to play with other impact players, as you mentioned earlier with Brew. Let's go back to a kid we talked about at the beginning of the show when Zaheer Mathis, the kid from Philly. Sure. Do you see other defensive linemen or maybe even linebackers wanting to play with him because how good he is? I don't know how you could watch the film of Mathis and not be like, let's just say we're talking about a middle linebacker. Yeah, yeah. And be like, well, I wouldn't want to play with that guy. He's going to get 10 sacks and 12 tackles for loss. Of course you're going to want to play with him. That's one of the things that I know just from knowing Urban back in the day that he would try to sell. Hey, I've got Johnny over here at this spot. If we get you to play with him, this is what we're going to do. you got to be able to show the kids – the motion picture before it's out. You know what I mean? Film of this kid, I'm sure they show each other and you call him and say, hey, he's calling to check up on you and also to let you know we just got a commitment from this guy that he's just as good as you, but another spot right next to you. Those little things build up. Getting Mathis early because, again, they're taking him for Penn State. He's from Philly. It's an area everybody recruits. Heck, Georgia's a recruit at that area in that school. That's going to help you. And it's Ohio State at a spot they need. Pass rushers. They need, you know, JT and guys, and when they leave, you don't just replace JT. That's a very, really, really, really special in-game, big-moment guy. You need as many bullets in the gun as possible to find ways to help replace that. You're not going to do it with one guy, right. in my opinion. Right. So kids that are 6'4", six, 6'5", six, with arms like trees, and they can move, yeah, that's what you're looking for. Kids are going to kids are gonna be around that and want to see it. Like he goes to an Under Armour camp or something like that, video starts going around. That's easy sell, brother. That's an easy sell. 
Brian, love having you on the show, guys. You can follow him on X, formerly known as Twitter, at FBScout underscore Florida. You can follow me on the same platform at JStevens07. We are out of here on a Monday, Buckeye fans. We will see you next time.